I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the founder of the church I served as a bishop. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many others have made a similar journey into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about, people who want to share their story. So if you're a Latter-day Saint seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I appreciate you spending some time with us. And we're here in St. George still, and we've got Zach Windsor today. Thanks, Zach, for coming over. Thanks for allowing me. Fine young man, and uh, kind of an interesting story you've got. Uh, <laughs> where were you born? I was born in Cedar City, Utah. I moved to Delta shortly after. With your family? Were yeah. they Mormon? Were they? My grandparents were very Mormon. Okay. Um, and you my spent... mom was kind of on and off. I spent the majority of my life with my grandparents. So. Oh, and they took you to church? and mm -hmm. you, Did you get baptized at age eight and all that I stuff? I did get and baptized, and then yeah. uh, I went up through the ranks up through a priest. Did you? Yep. Yeah. So, sir, were you a scout? Did you do scouting at all? I did scouting for like a year. <laughs> I give up on that. I'd rather play basketball, I decided. I know that happens to a lot of kids and the, and the thing. So uh, learned the primary songs though, probably. I and did. Went to primary and all that stuff. And where was that at? Was that in? Uh, Delta when I was younger, and okay. then a little bit in Salt Lake, and then I did all, well, all the middle and high school years were down here in St. George. Oh, they were, and that's where your grandparents lived. Yep. Oh, okay. So. Uh, you know, native, almost native, but well, not quite yeah, native. I'm pretty native close. <laughs> yeah. My family goes back all the way to Jacob Hamlin, so. Really? Yeah. He's a relative? He is, a great, oh. great, great uncle or something. Now, I know that name. He has a home here. Yeah, it's and over is that in the Santa one Clara. that Brigham Young used, or he used well, it? Or he it used it. Uh, the Brigham Young house is right in the middle of town by the tabernacle. Oh, okay. And Jacob Hamlin was one that settled, uh, settled Santa Clara. Oh, okay, and they preserved his home or mm -hmm. made it into a museum or just a yeah, they, it's something kind of, to look at. You can go up there. The oh. missionaries up there give tours and yeah. So they were. It's a, owned by the church. Yep. then, is it? Oh, interesting. So, uh, what happens after? Uh, I mean, during high school, and you go to seminary at all? Did you? I did go to seminary. It was you? a got to be a seminary president. My did you? freshman <laughs> year. And oh, good for you. Uh, I attended until my senior year. Yeah. I kind of give up on that. I, yeah. There were some other classes I wasn't attending as regularly yeah. as I should, so <laughs> I had to drop something to graduate. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. I understand. <laughs> so uh, you were telling me an interesting story about your state president. And yeah, so I went through high school. About mission and, time, I guess, was yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. So I went through high school. Um, believed in the church, wanted to be part of the church, but at the same time I, I wanted to party a little bit and yeah. I come to the conclusion I didn't want to go on a mission. Were there many kids in your area or your age group and the people you hung around with that were that same way? You know, there was only really a couple. Uh, was there? I'd say 90% of my group of friends ended up going. Did go on missions, huh? Yeah, only a couple of us didn't. Yeah. A lot of pressure to do it though, isn't there? Do you feel guilty not going or? Yeah, you know, I, I did. I would have felt guiltier going. I, and this was kind of the conversation that I was having with my bishop and stake president is, yeah. I, I wasn't worthy, and they, I mean, they really wanted me to get ordained an elder. And okay, so tell us the story. I'm sorry. Oh no, you're fine. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I decided I didn't want to go, and my stake president was also one of my real good friends' dads. Knew him really well. Yeah. And uh, I grew up just down the street from the temple, so my stake president's office was that church just across the street from the temple. Oh, okay. And uh, he called me up one night and he says, hey, I want to come talk to you. Come, come see me in my office. <laughs> All right, so I run over there and I walk in and he's sitting at the table and sitting next to him or sitting in his desk is uh, Jeffrey R. Holland, one of the 12 apostles. Right. <laughs> and I got to sit and They're talk. real big guns. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> And uh, come to find out that night, he grew up down the street from my grandma. He knows my family really well. So um, he's from St. George? Yeah. Okay. And wonderful man. I yeah. really enjoyed my conversation with him. Uh, yeah. 
I spoke for about an hour, but up to this point, I didn't really think the church wasn't true. Sure. I just didn't want to participate. Um, now he said something to me through the course of this, and this was time frame was 07, where a year or two years, somewhere in that time from when the church went, raised the bar on the missionary standards. Oh, right. And, and, and said that every able bodied young men should go. Yeah. And through the course of this conversation, he, he told me that uh, mission's not really for everybody. Oh. <laughs> And that kind of uh, struck you. Yeah, it struck me. It kind of bothered me. And the more I thought about it, the more I was like, well, if they can just come out that as a, a church policy and he's going to contradict it that quick, <laughs> it shook my faith quite a bit more than I think it would have. Really? Should have, maybe. Yeah. Um, so shortly thereafter, I actually ended up going just basically atheist, agnostic, or maybe. Now, isn't that an interesting step? I mean, you're a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, mm -hmm. and you're not the only one. I mean, there's many stories of that, people that uh, question the church and, and maybe move away from it, distance themselves from it. They become either agnostic or even atheist. Mm -hmm. And why is that, do you think? You know, for me, it was after that hit, it really came real to me how guilty I felt all the time. Oh, okay. uh, you're not ever really able to measure up, and and I'm not I'm not one of those that have left the church that felt like I was mistreated. Yeah. I love the people in the church. I still love all my family and yeah. all my friends. Um, but it was the little comments. It was you need a missionary style haircut. It was <laughs> oh, is that enough. shirt really appropriate? It was. I mean, there was always those little digs, and then there's the more pressure you put on yourself than anybody else could. Yeah. And after I'd come to a realization of that guilt that I was always holding, I, for me it just became easier not to believe in the God. Wow. Yeah, and you do, you're not measuring up. You're probably disappointing whatever God there is. And, mm -hmm. and you're disappointed yourself perhaps, or did was family or grand, grandparents kind of involved in this process too? Or? No. Nah. For them, I mean, they were there, and they let you make the decisions. Yeah, and they didn't put too much. No, nah, my grandparents are—they're sure. they're wonderful people. I mean, they yeah. definitely would say, "Well, maybe you should go on a mission." Or, <laughs> but I never felt for them. I can say I never felt they were really disappointed in me for not going on well, a mission. Well, that's good love then yeah. for them, isn't it? There's probably some other things I was doing they were pretty disappointed <laughs> in, but not that. <laughs> not that one. So, how long does this last and go on? So that lasted from basically I graduated high school until three or four years ago. Oh I, my goodness! So yeah, a few I, years, huh? Yep, and I was I got a job out of the mine in Ely, Nevada, yes. and you had to go do a big physical out there. And uh, oh, a, a physical to qualify to yeah, work at the mine. Okay. Yeah, a medical physical. And, yeah. And I was going through that, and the nurse practitioner guy. I, to this day, I wish I could remember his name to look this guy up. <laughs> Give him a big thanks or yep. something? <laughs> okay, <laughs> but we'll hear his story yeah. now. He was a Christian, and uh, he heard I was from Utah, and he started witnessing to me like I was a Mormon. <laughs> and he started telling me the differences between the, the Bible and Mormonism and all these things, and I got annoyed with him finally. <laughs> and I said, look, one, I'm not Mormon, but too, like, the Bible's not what you say it is, and Christ wasn't really a God, and it was the Council of Nicaea, they called him God. I gave him the Dan Brown, Da Vinci Code version of the Nicene <laughs> Creed. And nicest guy, I cannot remember to this day, word for word, what he said, but he made me feel dumb. <laughs> made you mad a little or something. Yeah, I got, I got a little upset. Yeah. Upset enough that I decided I was going to disprove God. Disprove God. Well, there's a challenge. <laughs> yep, and I didn't know what a big one it was. <laughs> but so I spent uh, well, the next almost two years. The first year I was just listening to uh, atheist debates, studying uh, the Big Bang Theory, physics, I mean, oh, wow. everything, biology, evolution. Yeah. And trying really hard to be fair and listen to both sides of the argument. Hmm. But I was still biased, and I knew I was biased. And even with that, 
I came to the conclusion that you can't disprove God. You can't really allow for anything, whether it's morality or, or the fact that we're here. You just sense there was a higher power yeah. and something that uh, was in charge, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, and apologetics became a really big thing for me after this whole process, just oh. because of studying all these things and listening to people like Ravi Zacharias and Jeff Durbin. And yeah. Uh, it's wonderful, yeah. wonderful things they come with that's real logic based. Right. Um, and so after I decided that there has to be a God, <laughs> I had to decide which religion was true. <laughs> you had to figure, well, somebody's got to be true. I yeah. assume you initially thought Mormonism would be that only <laughs> true church, was it? I, maybe not. I think I wanted it to be. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'd heard some stuff prior to that that had made me kind of doubt whether the church could be true, but it was the first one that I really delved into. Yeah. Anything specific come up? Well, the Joseph Smith, I mean, Joseph Smith's history, I was able to find his arrest records and <laughs> then really actually looked into his, like the prophecies even in DNC that yeah. never came to pass. And, yeah. Um, Unfortunately, it didn't, it didn't take me very long to cross Mormonism off that list. Looking for God, you didn't feel like you could find it there in Mormonism? No. I did. Well, you certainly hadn't. It didn't sound, doesn't seem like you found it the first few years of your life and mm -hmm. seminary and all that stuff, so yeah. interesting. So you looked elsewhere too then? Yeah, I, I actually, so about the second year of this process, I went through every major religion. I studied <laughs> the origins as best I could. I mean, I read the Quran. I oh my! Um, and it it came to the point where I was like, "All right, it's time to read the Bible again." You didn't you hadn't come to that conclusion before. <laughs> no. Well, part part of it is that Mormon. I mean, you probably knew the Eighth Article of Faith and mm. told you that you couldn't trust the Bible. Was that in the back of your mind? Yeah, I mean that really up until this point that had always been in the back of my mind that <laughs> the Bible's been corrupted and. Well, and you grow up, you hear Mormon's Christian. So if Mormon can't be right, then the Bible's wrong. So there was no reason for me to check it twice. Spent time with the Bible. Um, could have saved me a lot of time, had I, but. <laughs> <laughs> so you decided to pick it up. Yeah, right? so I picked it up, and, and it's not that I'd never read the Bible before. I probably read it from, you know, the Old and the New Testament three or four times while I was in high school. Really? The Bible? The Bible. That's unusual, isn't it? Or did you. Were you aware of others reading the Bible at the same time? Uh, not really. I had one friend, a uh, real great friend of mine. His name was Brock Griffith. He yeah. ended up going on a mission. Yeah. And uh, me and him read the Bible together. We used to go up and light a fire up on top of the mountain and every weekend. And My dude, goodness. I was a weird kid. <laughs> well, yeah, reading the Bible. So that's amazing. Uh, um, did you understand what you were reading? Did you kind of? I sure thought I did. Yeah. You're reading the words. Yeah, I was reading the words. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what was different this time? I went and got a Bible that uh, wasn't printed by the LDS Church. Okay. No, it didn't have the subheadings on every chapter that right. kind of summarized what was in the chapter for you. Was it for a red you. letter edition? It had Jesus' words in red, or did you notice that? Uh, I, I don't, don't honestly know. don't okay. even remember. <laughs> I went and I, I went out and got a red letter. Oh, they call okay. it a red letter edition because yeah, we don't have red letter in mm -mm. in our. Mormon scriptures, and I just wanted to read what Jesus said. That was it. I just wanted to see what yeah. he said. So anyway, go ahead. Um, yeah, so I, I just got a, and it was a King James Version. I didn't, Yeah. I still didn't trust any other translation. I, <laughs> um, of course not. And so, I mean, I guess I'd back up just a little bit before I actually get, read the Bible again. I started going through well, the testing the claim that it's not reliable. So I looked a lot into the manuscript evidence and... Really? Yeah, and then, okay, so well, there's manuscripts for it, but can we prove it? anything it says is right? And <laughs> so I learned about Tacitus and uh, Josephus and some contemporary historians of the time and how much they can back up. Well, look how well studied you are. That's awesome. Did you? you I got really mad when that school? guy made me look dumb. <laughs> Yeah, I can tell. <laughs> yeah, I learned about the Dead Sea Scrolls, which that was, was a baby for me. That one was a big one for me too because that 
they say that the Bible was corrupted from the apostasy forward. Exactly. So now you get Old Testament copies <laughs> that, that predate the apostasy, the so-called And they're just apostasy. about the same as we've got now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, that was a big one for me, too. The Great Isaiah Scroll was a big one. Uh, that's terrific. Um, but so after I went through that process, I was like, okay, well, if I doubt the that the Bible is a legit book, then I have to doubt that Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great existed, because there's more evidence for what the Bible says. Yeah, that's true. And so then I decided I needed to read it again. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I bought the copy without any of the headings, just normal King James Bible, and I started reading through it, and um, nothing really jumped jumped out at me until mm. the New Testament. Ah. Uh -huh. And the New Testament, there's, I mean, there's things all through it that are great to learn, but I got to, uh, I got to Romans 4, 5. <laughs> I think you can quote that. I can quote that? Let's hear that. Uh, Romans 4, 5 says, For he who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. His faith. His faith is counted as righteousness. Had you ever understood that concept before? <laughs> no. I, I think every time I read the Bible in high school, I could have just read the headings above the chapters and got the same amount out of it. That's a good point, yeah. Uh, um, and so I read that, and it was, it was like a huge slap in the face. You really understood what it said? Or did it, I mean, what did it say to you? Well, it was, yeah, I mean, the two, two lines out for who does not work... <laughs> And I probably sat there staring at the Bible for at that oh, wait for minute. ten That's or fifteen minutes because <laughs> I kept reading it and there was something in my head that was it just wasn't matching up. Yeah. And so I read it. I read it. Was it. that Mormon head thinking yeah, uh -huh. about right? Yeah. Because that I mean that's completely that verse alone was completely contrary to the gospel I was taught growing up. That's amazing. Um, How <laughs> fascinating. God, yeah. God just said, okay, here's a good scripture for you. Mm -hmm. Boing. <laughs> and so at that point, I, I stopped, and I went back to the beginning of, of the New Testament, and I started reading it all over again. Do you feel like your eyes were opened at that point? I, I do. I, I, I was catching more and more that <laughs> things that I had just skipped over that didn't jump out at me. Um, well, like when Jesus was asked what the greatest two commandments were. Yeah. I've, my whole life I had quoted that to love your God and to love your neighbor, and completely skipped over the first part that says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God, the Lord is one. Not three gods, <laughs> one yeah. God. And, and then Galatians 2.21 jumped out at me. Um, it says that for he, let's see, if righteousness depend on the law, then Christ died for nothing. Died in vain. Died in vain in yeah. the King James, yep. Yeah, those scriptures, and, and they started meaning more to you. Yeah. You'd read them before, it didn't mean anything, yeah. but all of a sudden your eyes are open. Isn't that something? Would, oh. would you call that your born again moment, or was it? did you have another such experience? I would actually call that my burn, born again moment. I would think so, when you all of a sudden, and then you're reading the Bible with new eyes. Yeah, and, yeah, now, and it's making God. sense now. Not, none of it's reading and just going in one ear and out the other, so to speak. Wow. Well, where are you at with your personal life at this point? Are you married? I am married. I have four kids. Well, no, I meant, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, when and this back happened, in the story. Yeah. yeah, so when all this happened, I was married. I had three kids. Oh, you did. Um, now, your wife's LDS. She grew she up LDS. LDS. I mean, grew um, up LDS. She left the church pretty well after high school. So you were both inactive together, yeah. so to speak? And mm -hmm. Did you... Share with her what you experienced. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> and now, did you tell her about the f physical therapy or the not whatever it was over there in Nevada? Yeah, I told her about what happened, and she basically said, "Well, knock yourself out, <laughs> <laughs> go study." <laughs> and uh, <laughs> but then, after I had all these moments, I started. Oh, babe, did you know this? Started sharing. Yeah. And the good her, news, the bad news, which did you? Well, showing her, well, showing her what the Bible was really saying and going, the good, the look, we news. were taught this, yeah, and yeah. this is what this is saying. And yeah. her response for probably the first six months was, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> you're, you're rocking my boat. Yeah. Even though I'm not active, you're rocking yeah. my boat. Yeah. 
And she was, I mean, just completely uninterested. She was bored of me trying to talk about it. Yeah. Um, and then one day, I, I don't remember why I was reading this one to or what brought it up, but the Pharisees come to Jesus at one point, and they're trying to trip him up, but they ask him if this woman marries this man and he dies. Oh, yeah. Her brother takes is her supposed to take her to her wife, and then if he dies, the next brother, and this goes on for seven brothers. Yeah. They say, now if all this happens, um, whose wife is she going to be in heaven? And Jesus says, well, there is no marriage in heaven. You're going to be as the angels, neither being given, neither giving or being taken in marriage. And she read that? And yeah, you I, showed it to yeah, her? Yeah, I showed that to her. And <laughs> there was a big one. Huh? There was a big light bulb for her on that. She's like, wait. And so I think she did the same thing. She sat there and stared at it and probably <laughs> read it 10 times. And What is this really saying here? Yeah. No, because so much of the LDS doctrine is built around that eternal marriage that's oh, going to last forever. And yeah, all that temple work. And, mm -hmm. yeah. So what did she do? Uh, so she then started asking me questions. Uh, and so we started talking a lot about her. And at this point, I had just discovered uh, Jeff Durbin on YouTube. Okay. He's out of Arizona. He is. Yeah, I know Jeff. And I know of him. Know of him. Yeah. And he's a uh, he's really he's a street preacher. He right. goes out. I really enjoy his sermons, but yeah. the stuff that really drew me to him first was listening to him actually talk with the LDS. Yeah, and you I could relate to what he was saying because you yeah. went on the other side. Well, and it was nice to hear somebody who would just who was talking with him, and he was loving, and he was gracious, but he was not compromising, and everything he said was something straight out of the Bible. Yeah. Um, and then to to watch uh, the LDS people really have nothing <laughs> to be able to answer that. Right. I, I think that that just reinforced kind of the where you where, where I you, had come from, yeah. come to. But oh, well, that's fascinating. Yeah. So did you and Charnay start going to church, and or, or did you? Uh, what we happened did. There? Um, it was probably a few months later, and I really had no interest in going to church. Which is weird. Even though you felt this yeah, draw I, to the Bible. And mm -hmm. But I, I don't know. I felt like I was so anti anything that felt like you were trying to earn your way into heaven. So even going to church yeah. was, was kind of in that category, huh? Yeah, and, and, and God took a while, but he, uh, he moved in my heart to kind of change that. But I was, I was really the same way about getting baptized into, the, into a Christian church also. Yeah. Um, it was just anything that was a work in my mind was hard for me to b yeah. chew off and yeah. I definitely had to come to some new understandings of what those things really mean and what they're what they're for but well so did you eventually get to a church and we do how's that, we did uh, how's that going? I love it yeah what, what did you think the first time you went you it's loud that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's what I, I, oh boy <laughs> Yeah. What else did you, I mean, things that you noticed? Things that I noticed, that, like again, really it was just, it was loud to going into worship. I think we showed up five or ten minutes late. Mm. And so we walked into this full band playing on stage, yeah. drums and guitars, and yeah. everybody was standing up and singing along, and there were some people with their hands up in the air. <laughs> Uh, actually it, worshiping. Yeah, right? actually yeah. worshiping. And being there because they want to be there, mm -hmm. not because they're earning their way to the celestial kingdom. Yeah. And the and words, were they up on the... Yep, the words were up isn't on Isn't that there. fun? And they were all about Jesus, aren't they? About they God are. and about God what and, he's done for and us. And his true gospel. And Yeah. Uh, it, it was amazing and how <laughs> happy everybody was. Really? I mean, yeah. And even one thing that struck me outside of the worship is when the... Uh, the pastor was actually up preaching, you look around the room and 90% of everybody was paying attention. <laughs> People had their Bibles open, they were following along, they were reading things. Oh, that is so different. I didn't notice one person with their tie rolled up on the pew and their forehead <laughs> on it trying to sleep, <laughs> which is what I always did. <laughs> or have their little things out playing games and stuff yeah. or whatever. And yeah. yeah, they're there because they want to worship and they want to be there. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
So what are we missing here? Why, why, is, uh, why does Mormonism not allow that? And why, you know, you were atheist after leaving the church, kind of, yeah. and you just, uh, you just kind of wonder why, why there's that step. You know, we just don't, we don't have, we, as Mormons, do, must not have a deep foundation with Jesus and yeah. the Bible. And so when we walk away, we're kind of empty. Yeah. Yeah. And then God reaches down and touches you. <laughs> yeah. And I, honestly, I just think, I think it's, a, it, it's an almost an exhaustion thing. You, you spend so much of your life, and I can't say that I spent, a, you know, 40, 50 years like some people I've talked to in yeah. the church. But you, but spend, you certainly watch your grandparents. Yeah. I'll bet they spent a lot of time mm -hmm. and effort into the church, didn't they? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, then they do, you know, the temples every Wednesday and Relief Society. And yeah. it's amazing how much time that being a member of the Mormon church can just demand from you. And it actually isn't moving you toward God. No. Or Jesus, you're just kind of it, doing. Yeah, <laughs> so much, much of it's just almost busy work. Yeah. Um, I, I almost think that when you leave the church, you're just spir spiritually and just exhausted. You're well, there have been a lot of people we've talked to that actually take that <laughs> 6, 10, 8, 20 years to, mm -hmm. to kind of group, regroup, and, and then God does call them out. And so, well, we've just got a little bit of time left, and anything you'd like to say to your family, friends, what you, uh, you, you feel happy about where you're at? Yeah, I, I love where I'm happier now than I've been. I mean, really, it, that in what I can recall, memory-wise, it's just a joy there, isn't there? There a is kind of freedom. There is. Well, and there's a there's a purpose there to that. It's a different kind of purpose than the the to-do list that I had in Mormonism. Like but, what? Well, like I I feel very driven since I've been saved to share the gospel. Oh. Um, I've actually done a couple different interviews similar to this one. Have you? A little shorter. Okay. Um, just talking about the understanding the Bible after Mormonism. Yeah. And then awesome. I've gone, I went up to Manti last year and did some street. During the pageant. Yeah, the during pageant. the pageant. That's and kind did of some street preaching. And, and I, th there's a purpose there that's, that's something that I, you know, I want to do, but I feel driven to do. Well, good for you. That. Well, God puts it on our heart, like you said, love God, love our fellow man, and mm -hmm. yeah. Well, gosh, we're out of time, Zach. Yeah. That goes quick, doesn't it? That does. Yeah. Well, you're a great young man, and you've got, what, three children, did you say? Four children Four now. Four children, good for you. And uh, your wife's with you. Yep. And you're able to worship together. That's a blessing. It is. Because that doesn't always happen. So, well, thanks again for sharing your story. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, you bet. And we'll see you next time on the Ex-Mormon Files.